like Jesus in the garden. You don't call or you won't leave. I want to love like you love. I want to bleed like you bleed. Good morning. Welcome this morning. It's good to see all of you here. And uh, does the name um, Bobby Hastings mean anything to anyone? I'm not sure that maybe it would. Uh, Bobby Hastings is the head equipment manager of the Toronto Maple Leafs hockey team. And okay, no groaning, no moaning. <laughs> Fair enough, just go with me here at the least. Um, during a game, Hastings could be seen behind the bench very, very closely watching the play. This was a video that was released of um, just sort of his, his work and his diligence in his job. And uh, when a player on the ice would touch the puck, Hastings would kind of move his hand and rest it on that player's backup hockey stick. And the idea being that if that player on the ice were to break a stick, then Hastings would be very quick to pull out the backup stick and get it to the player on the ice. And so closely watching, moving his hand back and forth, and sure enough, during the game, a player called Mitch Marner broke his stick, came by the boards, came by the bench, and right away the Hastings had the stick ready to go. And without losing his stride, Marner skated into the offensive zone, received a pass, scored a goal. There's no cheering. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Diligence matters, right? Diligence matters. We live in a world of distractions. Every day we can get tempted, threatened, maybe even sometimes deceived that we don't focus on what God wants us to. So a few questions, like how are your spiritual practices? Are they consistent or are they a bit casual? Uh, what's, the, what's your spiritual rhythm in your life? Is it kind of faithful or is it maybe a little bit more flat? When it comes to your friends or work or school or conversations, are you always true to yourself, or do you kind of get into that game where you're bending over backwards, trying to people please and fit in? See, diligence matters. Paul talks about it in Romans 12, 11. He says this, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. That's a tough call, right? Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Because here's the problem. Over time, our passion can fade. Over time, we can get distracted. Over time, we can drift. Over time, we can get tired. We can get complacent. Our alertness to God-honoring things wanes. Our spiritual habits and patterns lessen. And when this happens, the enemy likes to get in all close and cozy. Diligence matters. Best way to keep your zeal, best way to keep your spiritual fervor is to be in God's Word. It's that simple. Now somehow, I honestly couldn't fully explain it, but somehow when we spend time reading our Bible, God whispers words of wisdom and guidance and direction and truth into our minds. He enables us to set our minds on things above, not on earthly things. We view our circumstances differently. We see the world in a different way. We view people from a different perspective. Our thoughts, our ideas become more like God's as we develop a mind like Christ. And not, does only, not only does this help us keep our zeal and spiritual fervor, but we also benefit from being able to relax and to trust and to quiet ourselves and to discover peace and confidence and even contentment. Diligence matters. Best Bible reading doesn't just occur with miscellaneous random verses. 
It comes from a planned and intentional reading of God's word, a regular time, a comfortable space, a quiet setting, a reading plan to follow, right? Diligence matters. Best way to keep your zeal, best way to keep your spiritual fervor is to diligently be in God's word. Diligence matters. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so so much for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the work that happens just as we read it. It is remarkable to me that how lives can change just by sitting in your word. And sometimes we read stuff we don't fully understand, but as we stick with it, we find that all of a sudden those things begin to make a little bit more sense as we are diligently spending time in your word. Lord, help us to do that. And as we move into our service this morning and as we sing songs that really come from Scripture and as we hear a good word from Dana, Lord, help us to again be um, zealous and, and have our spiritual fervor being in tune with this and putting these things into our mind so that we can continue to draw closer to you and to worship you well. And so we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, would you stand with us as we worship this morning? Um, Psalm 47 1 says, Clap your hands, all peoples, shout to God with loud songs of praise. Hey, we can practice some of our fervor and our <laughs> spiritual excitement and joy as we worship. And this, this first song, hey, it definitely allows for that. So, uh, would you worship with us this morning? good and your mercy endureth forever. Sing that again. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
I just have a couple of announcements for you this morning. Um, first one is there's a men's work day coming up uh, May the 18th. So if you would like to help out with the actual work, there is one QR code there for you. And if you have work to be done, then please use the other QR code and we'll try to organize that. Um, type of work, probably not going to be doing a major renovation on your basement, but <laughs> if you need uh, stuff put away from the winter and summer stuff brought out, thinking like hammocks set up and then tested, all those sorts of things, <laughs> that would be great. So um, just whatever you think it might be, there, there's the uh, information's there, uh, May the 18th uh, during the day to get some, uh, if you need some work done, we've got a bunch of men here that are willing to uh, help out with that. Uh, other announcements, you may have noticed that there is a giant trailer taking up parking spots at the end of the driveway or end of the parking lot there. Um, the hope is that if any of you have some, now hear this well, good, good, good used furniture, right, um, and you're just looking to kind of unload it and have somewhere to put it, we will take it and then we will farm it out to folks that are in need of beds, cribs, uh, couches, dining room tables, whatever that might be. So if you've got something to be um, unloaded from your place, just uh, contact me and uh, we'll make some arrangements to try and get that moved here. It'll be stored in the trailer and then as the needs arise, we'll be able to uh, farm that out to the folks that need it. Uh, final announcement uh, is kind of a, an FYI piece. There was um, a meeting with uh, Montague Christian Church and Cornerstone in Montague on Wednesday night's leadership. Um, I guess the meeting didn't go quite as expected. There was some um, pullback from Montague Christian Church, and so things are kind of on, on hold right now. Not sure if that merger is going to move forward or take place. So that's certainly disappointing. Um, I imagine that as those congregations are made aware of that information this morning, there will be lots of questions and lots of disappointment, maybe some celebration. I don't know. It's just going to be a whole mix of emotions, and I imagine it's going to be challenging for both Paul and Tyler to negotiate that with their congregations um, this morning as they lead in worship. Um, maybe it would be just a good idea for us to take a moment and to just kind of pray for those two congregations, pray for the plan, pray for the process, and just kind of see, um, is there some questions now about what's going to happen? Uh, let's just kind of give it to God, and let's just uh, look to uh, lean on him as, we, as this tries to get figured out. So if you will, pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, I know this was um, not the plan moving forward, at least not our plan moving forward. And I know there is some questions. I know there is some confusion. I do know there's some, um, like, what now? Where do we go from here moments? I know there will be some in congregations this morning that will hear this and will be upset. Huh? Some will hear it and will be um, angry. Some will hear it and will be sad. Um, it's just going to be a whole mix of emotion this morning as both Paul and Tyler look to negotiate this out with their congregation. So, Lord, here's what we're praying. We're praying, first of all, that there is wisdom and there is um, good words being used this morning as both Paul and Tyler talk this out. I pray that you would guard their hearts, that they would be able to uh, process this and proceed with this in a way that's honoring to you. Lord, I pray that as there is confusion and lots of questions about what now, that there would be a, a realization and a remembering that you weren't, su you weren't surprised by this, that you weren't sort of going, uh-oh, need to go back to the drawing board, that this did not at all take you by surprise, and you've got a plan. And um, Lord, I pray that some of that assurance in that you know what's going to happen next will um, fall on the congregations and will fall on the leadership. And Lord, just help them to uh, process this out. As they come into a spot of worship this morning and hearing this, Lord, I pray that they will turn to you. And I pray they will turn and lean on you and they will recognize, Lord, that you are still a God who's in control. You're still a God who loves people. You're still a God that wants to see amazing things happen in Montague. 
And as the churches continue to negotiate this out, Lord, that you will indeed make it very clear what the next steps are and how this is going to progress and how this is going to play out. So in the midst of all of the confusion, in the midst of all of the, uh uh-oh, how did this happen? Lord, I just pray that it'll be you that grants some peace and understanding. It'll be you that will be the rock in the midst of all of this and that there will be a turning and a leaning on you throughout this process as it looks to develop. Lord, may we be a people that will continue to remember Paul and Tyler in prayer as they continue to work through the next number of days and weeks as this all gets sort of figured and negotiated out. So, Lord, we give it to you, and we trust you, and we lean on you, and we wait for you to move, and we wait for you to make things amazing, and we wait for you to do some incredible stuff in the town of Mount Agu. So in your name we pray. Amen. I ask our ushers to come forward as we look to collect this morning's tithes and offerings. Uh, As the offering plate passes uh, your row, feel free to stand as we continue in worship. same God that never fails will not fail me now, will not fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out, working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all oh, my days. Oh, yes, I will.
there's no longer room if it isn't you i'll make a sacred space to meet with you face to face i'm closing all the doors to all that isn't yours oh i'm only here for you you are my
I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. And if anyone should slap you on your right cheek, turn and give him the other one also. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Good morning, my sisters and brothers. Oh, you are so wide awake and ready to go. <laughs> Thanks, Nina. <clears throat> Cheryl and team, thank you for fixing our hearts and our minds on Jesus through the gift of music this morning. Uh, it's, been, it's been over a year since I've spoken here, and so I have, I have a lot of butterflies in my guts right now, so if you would... If you would pray me through this morning, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, this morning, if you are, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Dana. I'm one of the pastors here. Hello there, Stephen. Good to see you this morning. <laughs> uh, if you are physically able, I would ask that you would please stand in honor of and respect for the Word of God. Two portions of Scripture, both spoken from the lips of Jesus neither of which are going to be on the screen. And I will be reading this morning from the New King James Version. And the first portion is in Luke chapter 6, starting at verse 15. And I would like you in particular to pay attention to the words that I put special emphasis on. Luke chapter 6, starting at verse 15. These are the words of our king. Take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that they or we possess. And then Jesus spoke a parable to them and he said, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought, What shall I do? Since I have no room to store my crops. And so he said, I will pull down my barns and I will build bigger ones. And there I will store all of my crops and my goods. And I will say to myself, self, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your, e take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, tonight you are going to die. Who's going to get your money and who's going to get your stuff then? This, says Jesus, is the person who lays up treasure for themselves and are not rich toward God. Now turning back to the first book in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 19, resuming our study from the Sermon on the Mount, more words from our King. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Where moth 
and rust destroy. And where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy. And where thieves do not break in and steal. For where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. Skipping down to verse 24. No one can serve two masters. We will hate one and we will love the other. We will be loyal to one and we will despise the other. And I love when things are black and white, don't you? One cannot serve God and money. This is the word of the Lord. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. You may have a seat. When at college, it was common folklore that if a pastor wanted to stay in the good graces of their congregation, they would stay as far away as possible from preaching about three things, sex, politics, and money. I don't know what this says about myself or my family, but last week in Long Creek, my brother preached on sex. This morning, I'm preaching about money. And into and across a cultural narrative that accuses the Christian church of they just want your money. (laughs) Here we go. (laughs) (laughs) By means of introduction this morning. Most of us have learned by now that Jesus loves us too deeply to leave us the way we are. As such, he does not shy away from getting up close and personal sooner rather than later, always out of his great love for us. Jesus will say things that will cut close to the bone and they will make us squirm. Not because he necessarily enjoys that sort of thing, but primarily because he's God and we're not. And that's a truth we ignore or deny at our own peril. Rather than contenting himself with our surface behavior, Jesus is even more interested in why we do what we do or don't do. Understanding that this is the only path to real transformation. Rather than opting for superficial plastic surgery that just pretties up the outside... He's always getting to the heart of the matter. And that is why the Christian experience consists of a lifetime of going under God's knife, during which he removes our sinful, broken hearts of stone and in their place gives us a heart of flesh that beat first for him and then for one another. And as he starts tweaking and tuning the command centers of our heart, we quickly discover that the requirements and expectations for living as a citizen of his kingdom are radically different than those who march to a drummer of their own choosing. You have heard it said, said Jesus, referring to ulterior drummers, but I, the king, say, to you. God's requirements and expectations will not be equally appreciated by everyone. Some of you here this morning have learned from firsthand experience that if, when, and as we decide to take the kingship of God seriously, we will experience kickback. This world would love us, said Jesus. In John 15, if we belong to it. But any who wear my name are no longer part of this world. I chose you to come out of this world. And that's why it hates you. 
John picks up that thread in his first letter. Do not love the world or things that it offers. A craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything that we see, an ill-proportioned pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, says John, but these are from this world, a world that is fading away along with everything that people, that you and I, that we crave. And so I share this morning's message, fully aware of its sensitivity, recognizing that at times the Lord's instruction will inevitably cause a tension within our spirits, but also praying that rather than leave this building affirmed in our own prejudices and positions, we will forever be developing ears, hearts, minds, and bodies that are sensitive to what the King of Kings says. That eventually our go-to response to the Lord, regardless of what it is he tells us, will be, because you say so, I will. And so with that spirit, I would invite you to pray with and for me this morning. Our Father which art in heaven, now as we jump into your word, we pray, as did Jesus, not my will, but yours be done. And it is in his precious name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> to start our time together, a very personal question. So without, without thinking about who's on your left or who's on your right, or this is just for you. What is it that you most highly prioritize, value, treasure, invest in, and why? Got it? Perhaps almost equally important, what does the world in which we live encourage us to most highly prioritize, value, treasure, invest in, and why? This morning I propose that the scriptures consistently teach that the priority list of a citizen of heaven will look radically different from that of a citizen of the world. And one of the arenas that this conflict between kingdoms is highly visible is in one's relationship to money and stuff. In 1984, this, this illustration will resonate much more with this service than the next, in which most of them weren't even born at this point. In 1984, I was 13 years old, and that is the year that the pop singer Madonna released the second single from her monumental Like a Virgin album. And if you remember the video at all, it, it, showed, it showed Madonna aping Marilyn Monroe's 1953 performance of the movie, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. The whole time she was singing, we are living in a material world, and I am a material girl. Materialism can be defined as an attitude or posture of the heart that elevates and actively encourages the pursuit of money, stuff, and physical comfort. Materialism, an attitude or posture of the heart that elevates and actively encourages the pursuit of money, stuff, 
and physical comfort. And I intentionally use those words, attitude and posture of one's heart, because it allows for the reality that materialism has little to do with the amount of one's money and possessions. You can be a materialistic beggar, and you can be an unrealistic millionaire. It's all about the heart. The poet William Wordsworth clearly had his finger on the materialistic bent when he wrote in 1807, this world is too much with us. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Or, if that's too old, the contemporary essayist Eve Ensler says, materialism is the cancer of make it, have it, own it now. And this morning, while... As a student of history, it would be irresponsible for me to say we are living in the most materialistic age of all time. I don't necessarily believe that that is true, but I am confident enough to say that materialism is one of the loudest and most dominant, perhaps even defining, siren songs of the age in which we live. And for those of you who question why or how I get there, I would just like to throw out a few questions or observations for how I would say such a provocative statement. What does it say about a society that pummels its citizens, you and I, every waking moment with memes and mantras like money talks. Money makes the world go around. The one with the most toys wins. Another day, another... <laughs> Time is... Diamonds are a girl's best friend. God help us if any of those are true. God help us if any of those are true. A planet, what does it say about a planet in one of the most influential countries in the Western world is brazen enough to inscribe in God we trust on their currency while exhibiting just the opposite on a daily basis. Ours is a world in which credit card debt routinely cripples individuals and families, holding them back from becoming all that God has created them to be. Ours is a society in which governments routinely buttress budgets by lotteries and games of chance that can lead to devastating addiction. Ours is a culture in which people are driven to work an inhuman amount of hours, many of them just to try and keep their heads above water. Ours is a world in which an actual theological system called the prosperity gospel has not only taken root, but has been exported all over the world, all over the globe, teaching that if, when, as you or I or anyone has enough faith in Jesus, we will never be physically ill and our bank accounts will forever be overflowing. Ours is an ethos in which it doesn't even cause a moment of sober pause when we hear money blasphemously referred to as the all mighty dollar. It's a system in which I can ask a carload of 13-year-olds 
what they want to be come in their life. And in unison, without even a second, like they had this coordinated, they all scream at the top of their lungs, Rich! Materialism. For the record this morning, Jesus never said that in and of itself money and or possessions are bad. He never asks his followers to give everything away in the mode of St. Francis of Assisi. In fact, the Gospels record Jesus only telling one person to give everything that he had away. He doesn't say that it's sinful to either make and or invest money wisely. He doesn't teach that one should not enjoy the good things of life, like trips and food and vacations and coffee and concerts and books and albums. He doesn't say that one should not save responsibly. But here in Matthew 6, he does say, that the things that we choose to value or treasure can be broken into two camps, earthly and heavenly. The things of earth, that time and dust and moths and rust and thieves make short work of. And Jesus critiques earthly treasures for being both temporal and troublesome temporal reflected in the slide. Their value is time specific. They have a short shelf life. They are here today and they're gone tomorrow. The depreciation value of earthly treasures is short. We cannot take it with us when we go. That's why you never see a purse pulling a U-Haul. Or To cite John, this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. If you recall, this is one of the dominant messages of the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. Everything under the sun, everything in the here and now has an expiration date. It is vulnerable and eventually will give way to decay. Having come from dust to the dust, it shall return. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? Jesus not only critiques earthly treasures for being short-lived, he also says that they can be problematic. Here in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus uses the word worry five times. Twice concerning what we eat, twice concerning what we wear, once about life in general. The logic runs like this. The more we have, the more we have to lose. The more we have to lose, the more we have to look after. The more we have to look after, the more loss we'll feel when it's gone. Which, being under the sun, being temporal, it is not a matter of if we lose it. It's simply a matter of when. When one is mastered by materialism, it naturally positions a person on a cul-de-sac of angst, not unlike a dog chasing its tail. And in an ironic twist of fate, the very things that we bank on for security actually end up fueling our insecurity. I find it interesting that only a few chapters later in Matthew, Jesus describes seeds that land on thorny soil. And listen to how he describes what he defines them as being. These are people, Jesus says, who hear the good news. But the cares of this life and the longing for money choke out God's word. The theologian John Stott captures perhaps the most damning consequence of materialism when he states that it effectively tethers our hearts to this earth. Oh, that's good. 
This world is too much with us. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. This approach or paradigm is reflected in the prosperous farmer of Luke chapter 6 that we started with. The alternative, Jesus says, is investing our time and our treasure and our energies into heavenly things. People, things, endeavors that are identified by being eternal and that result in peace rather than turmoil. How is this best done? Paul writes in his first letter to Timothy, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of material riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. We are to do good. We are to be rich in good works. We are to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up, for tre storing up treasure for a good foundation for the future so that we may take hold of true life. Isn't it interesting how a Christian's perspective of true life is so different from the world's? Who or what do we treasure? And why? But for those of us who are more comfortable with bullet points, rather than leaving you this morning with an abstract philosophical TED Talk on who owns what, I'll bring this morning's plane into land by briefly sharing four biblical precepts around this theme. And these will be our points of application this morning. Firstly, and it has to be firstly, God's providence. God's providence. And for those of you unfamiliar with that word, it's just such a fancy way of saying that not only does God own it all, Psalm 24 says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, everything is his. But not only does he own it all, he loves to generously provide for his kids. You understand, right, that God knows what we need better than we do? And he has promised to generously provide all of our needs according to his riches in glory. 2 Corinthians 9 and 8 says, God will generously provide not some, but all of what we need. It's why from the keyboard over there, it brings such a smile to my face to see hands fully extended as we sing, all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. And if that's too contemporary for you, all I have needed, your hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. That recognition of God's providence leads to the second precept. Humility and gratitude. Grumpy, complaining, sour, Christians drive me nuts. Now that it's recorded, that's on the record. <laughs> I can't take it back, but it's still true because in light of God's grace, and in light of God's goodness, 
the Christ follower's life should be marked and recognized for its humility and gratitude. From the Old Testament book of Psalms, I will praise you, Lord, with all of my heart. I will tell of all the marvelous things that you have done. From Psalm 103, let all that I am praise the Lord with my whole heart. I will praise his holy name. May I never forget the good things he has done for me. He forgives our sins. He heals our diseases. He redeems us from death. He crowns us with love and tender mercies. He fills our lives with good things. How would be his name? Psalm 107. Let us praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done. For he satisfies the thirsty and he fills the hungry with good things. The first song that we were led in this morning, Lord, you are good and your mercies endure forever. 1972 was a great year. I was born in 1972. And in that year, the Christian soul artist, Andre Crouch, had a smash song in which he simply asked, how can I say thanks for all the things that you've done to me? Things so undeserved, yet you gave to prove your love for me. The voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude. So all that I am and ever hope to be, I owe it all to thee. With his blood, he has saved me. With his power, he has raised me. To God be the glory for the things that he has done. Gratitude and humility. Thirdly, and a little more heavy for us to think about, our responsibility and our stewardship. In Genesis chapter 2, we find the creator God calling his creatures to steward, to tend, to responsibly care for the place that he's given them to live, as well as the other living things. Over in Matthew 25, Jesus tells another parable in which a businessman entrusts different amounts of the company's shares to three of his employees before he leaves the country. Upon his return, the boss calls each of the three to his office to give an account for what they've done and how they've used what he has given to them. Two of the employees used their master's money to make more. The third buried a hole, dug the money in, and the master returned. What have you done with what I've entrusted to you? You can probably guess which worker did not get the Employee of the Month Award, right? With each passing year, I'm 52 now, I think. I'm around that. With each passing year, the words of Jesus in Luke 12 and 48 rattle my spirit. When he says, to whom much is given. <laughs> to whom much is given. Much will be required. And I have no idea. I'm not into end time stuff. I figure it'll happen when the Lord wants it to happen. And so whatever it looks like, it looks like. And so I'm not deep into eschatology and all of that sort of thing. And I have no idea how many judgments there are going to be or what each of the judgments is going to look like. But a question that has been rattling my psyche for the last few years in particular has been this one. How and what am I going to respond if someday the one who can read every heart and mind asks me to give an account of, of what I've done? with everything that he's entrusted to me. I find that sobering. 
Am I, are you, are we being wise stewards? Fourthly and finally, contentment. Contentment. In Philippians 4, Paul testifies, I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing. I know how to live with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full belly or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do all things through Jesus Christ, who gives me strength. Do you realize, my sisters and brothers, what a testimony, what a witness one's contentment can be? in an age of discontent. At the risk of sounding like a socialist, we live in what is called a free market capitalistic system, which rises or falls on its ability to persuade the general public, you and I, that we are actually discontented. That is what fuels the new and improved. Until the Lord brings situations into your life, like one that I had 30 years ago when I participated in a week-long short-term mission trip to New York City, hosted by the New York School of Urban Ministry. And one night while I was there passing out bags of toiletries and snacks to people living on the street, I met a guy whose home was a cardboard box, a fridge box. In the course of our conversation, he told me that in years gone by, he had been a successful shoe salesman in Oakland. But when the earthquake of 1989 happened, he lost his store. That had a domino house of, card effects, house of cards effect, which led to his wife and two boys leaving him, and here he was a few years later living in a cardboard box in New York City. And there on the sidewalk, standing beside his cardboard box home holding a Ziploc bag of granola bars and a comb, all he wanted to do with tears rolling down his cheeks was tell me how thankful he was for how God, good God had been in his life. You want to talk about something that messes with someone's head and heart. He had learned, as did Paul, the secret of being content. Providence. God will provide, maybe not, probably not, everything that we want, but everything that we need. Give us this day our daily bread. Gratitude and humility. How open are our eyes and hearts to the moment-by-moment -moment gifts of God's goodness and grace? We should be singing the doxology at least once in our church. Thirdly, stewardship. How are we using what God has entrusted to our care? Fourthly, contentment. In a world that is marked by growing discontent, grumbling and complaining, am I, are you, are we recognized for being content in who the Lord is? Who or what do we treasure and why? I'm going to call Cheryl and the band to come back. And as they, as they lead us in one final song, to a certain degree, Madonna was right. We are living in a material world. The question then becomes, as a Christ follower, how do we best glorify our king while making our journey to our real home? 
In this morning's text, Jesus provides a matrix or standard through which to evaluate our relationship with money and things. And he strikes to the very heart of the matter in verse 24. No one can serve two masters. We will hate one and we will love the other. We will be devoted to one or we will despise the other. And so Jesus clearly lays down the gauntlet for us this morning. Either God owns our possessions and he is our master. Or our possessions own us. The band is going to close us with a song. I would ask you to stand, please. Then we're going to pray. So I would invite you, we'll bring up that slide, 
Greg, I'd invite you to pray with me as the Lord instructed us to pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I love the fact that you just outed yourselves as whether you're King James people or not. Thank you for worshiping this morning. Have a great week, everybody. God bless you all. We'll see you next week.